The birth of modern painting most likely took place in France in the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, under the impetus of the modern era brought forth by the Industrial Revolution and the liberalization of customs. Behind the various appellations, such as Impressionism, Pointillism, Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism, Surrealism, and Abstract Art, the artist became more than a witness. He became an actor, even a media of modern society. The works of these visionary painters who shape the essence of modern painting are today among the most prized on the market. This documentary series presents an overview of the various actors of these different movements. The Nabi movement, born around 1890, is characterized by the exaltation of color, the simplification of shapes, and the sublimation of the everyday. The painters Édouard Vuillard, Maurice Denis, and Pierre Bonnard have grand intellectual and spiritual ambitions. They endeavor in their practice to rediscover the sacred character of painting and to provoke a new spiritual enthusiasm through art. Pierre Bonnard is born October 3, 1867. Initially rejecting the traditional style of painting in favor of areas of flat color, the painter progressively finds a path of his own. In order to paint intimate subjects, he uses interiors or nudes, windows opening onto gardens, and impressionistic techniques served by palettes of light and luminous colors all of it supported by a very firm sense of composition and design. He is also very interested in the trend of Japanism and the different conception of perspective that is found in kakemono. Once famous, Pierre Bonnat can't stop himself from retouching his paintings after they've been exhibited or sold. His friends call this bonarding, or to bonardize. He's an intimist painter whose favorite model for many years was his wife, Matt. One of the versions of nude in the bath shows Marta taking a bath. You could say it was painted practically directly from the model, but that would be a mistake. It is one of the clichés we have about Bonnard. Bonnard generally paints his canvas facing the wall, with his back to the model. He usually takes down a series of sketches very quickly, on the spot. During the big exhibition in 2006, we showed all his diaries, which has lots of atmospheric notes about the weather, but also lots of small sketches. He also made sketches of this painting, which show the difficulty of facing the model for him. He says a lot about this theme in particular, and he expresses above all the great difficulties of finishing this suite that he undertook in the beginning of the 30s. Here, we are in 36, there are still more versions to come one of which is a large version called the large bathtub. And we have all of Bonnard's art deployed, especially his very distinctive utilization of color and his attitude, which is reflected in his composition. What is distinctive about Bonnard is this flight from the subject, and that at the same time he is able to reproduce it as though he really saw it. His notes are so precise that he is able to re-spatialize this type of emotion. Et 
There, he uses deep purples and yellows, which is all entirely false, because it's the light that enters the room that adds color to the white tile. There is something quite marvelous in this utilization of color, which is not simply the color's temperance, but the way in which the color can act. Indeed, he said color acts, and it has a delayed reaction. Often in his works, especially in his compositions, there are details that you don't see when you look at the painting. You have to allow time for the color to act so you can see the details. He goes back over things sometimes in the design and gives traits a little vigor when he senses that they're beginning to fade. So here, the frankly incredible success in this vibrato of the light, which is truly the subject of the painting. In this entire series, is probably the most finished, most successful painting. The painting was acquired for the Paris International Exhibition of 1937, and it couldn't be shown right away because the Petit Palais Museum was not open. And one day, at the Petit Palais, Bonnard, who neither knew how nor liked to finish a painting, went to correct it on site. He went in secret with his little box to finish the painting, which was finally completed in 1938. Bonnard's personality was shaped between the end of Impressionism and the start of the Nabi movement, of which he was one of the artists. His sensitive view of a world predominated by an enchanted, stirring, and luminous nature confronts reality. Even if it appears simple, Bonnard's oeuvre reveals itself to be complex, full of nuance, detached from time. Pierre Bonnard, before becoming the painter we know, began his studies in law in order to please his family and his father in particular. But, with his law degree in hand, life at the public prosecutor's department in Paris hardly interested him. He was already very passionate about drawing at the time. It was his grandmother who encouraged him to follow this path. And he obtained permission from his father to study art, which he did, even with his law degree in hand, because he realized that he was really not very motivated to have a career in law. Bonnard belonged to a notable family, and his father was a civil servant in the Ministry of War. The women have a certain penchant for art and especially music, and Bonnard's sister André was a pianist. There was a culturally important world at home. Through his sister, he met various musicians, like Claude Terrasse, who will become his brother-in-law, and with whom he will often work in his youth, along with the other Nabi, illustrating of the partitions for the Théâtre de l'Oeuvre in Paris. There will be a real encounter between literature, music and painting, because the Nabi will truly take on all the dominions of art. Aside from his illustrations, in the beginning he paints scenes, familial or otherwise, that are quite impressionist like this bourgeois afternoon in which his friend Claude Terrasse appears. This large painting shows a recreated family scene set to the Grand Lamps mansion in the Alps mountains, which was owned by the Bonnard family. You can recognize the house clearly, with its characters stationed at the windows or entering the house through the French doors, like in the theater. It's like a frieze, with all the characters put together and show the Bonnard family as well as neighbors who came to eat in the garden of the Grand Lamps. To the left, you can recognize Bonnard's brother-in-law, the composer Claude Tarras, who is very tall. We see him in his white suit. 
There are also the guests, who are two neighbours, with the somewhat heavy silhouettes of country folk. Bonnard employs a lot of humour here, as the characters are almost caricatured, but they also express a certain tenderness. There are gestures of it around the children, around the animals, and in the great softness of the summer landscape, with the flowering trees around the house. It is a recreated scene that evokes the composition of the great classical Fries in its choice of attitudes and characters. But, at the same time, it's an outdoor scene, benefiting from colours that are quite brilliant, and it's as if the air was circulating through the congregation. During his course at the School of Fine Arts in Paris, he met the young painter Edouard Vuillard, who created the Nabi group. Friendships were born within this group that also included Maurice Denis and Félix Voloton, former classmates. Together, they will be strongly inspired by the work of Paul Gauguin. There is a group of friends that he already knew at Condorcet High School in Paris. And he also frequents Edward Vuillard and Maurice Denis, with whom he will create the Nabi movement, influenced by Paul Gauguin, who was very influential at the time, even if he left France to go paint in the islands of the South Pacific. A great influence on young artists in particular, with his use of rather violent colours, solid colours, and the utilisation of outlines. And there is the decorative aspect paintings as well, as the Nabis will be interested, beyond diesel paintings, in what can be done with paint, like screens, fans and decorations. They want art to invest every possible field in people's daily life. Standing before these four decorative panels, we are before a work of youth, the first that Bonnard will officially exhibit at the Paris Salon of the Independence in 1891. He initially conceived of these panels as a screen, but he will write to his mother saying, no, these panels are really too strong to be seen as a screen, posed on the floor and presented as they would be in the salon. I'm going to dismantle them and turn them into four decorative panels that will be presented side by side. This screen project perfectly illustrates the desire of the Nabis to involve art in every area of daily life. What's more, these formats, strongly vertical, also show the influence of Japanese painting, which greatly interested Gauguin as well. In this youthful work, you can see right away the principles that were developed during Bonnard's Nabi period. These are mainly the decorative, the stretching of lines into arabesques, this formations and the fusion of elements between these women and nature. There are four women. There have been studies that compare them in a quite demonstrative and fair manner to Japanese prints, like the women of Utamaru, for example. These women are viewed against backgrounds that are natural, but very stylized, that reduce nature to lines, to points, to marks, indicate a great movement more than a succession of portraits. But you can recognize these women, his sister André and his cousin Bertha, with whom he was in love at the time. These women, young, beautiful and beloved, are shown in this environment that is very Art Nouveau, with these decorative lines. So, it is a very important work for the understanding of Bonnard's early stage and his commitment to the decorative and Japanism, as Bonnard was nicknamed the very Japanard Nabi of the group. At the end of the 19th century, the artists who are followers of Japanism include Van Gogh, Manet, Degas, and of course Gauguin, the Nabis. 
Fobona, the revelation of the Japanese prince, takes place in 1890, on the occasion of an exhibition of Japanese prints at the Paris School of Fine Art. It's love at first sight for him and for the entire generation of young artists, his friends, the Nabis. These prints are filled with solid colours due to the process of wood carving and are influential because they make it possible to remove the third dimension from painting. This is what these artists will retain as a lesson for their paintings. The desire to fuse the different planes of reality into one plane means that, since the Renaissance, compositions were painted as though they were cubes whose sides were flattened. This lesson is immediately translated here. We are one year after the exhibition, with his first decorative panel as well as other paintings. Pierre Bonnard is the first Nabi to be interested in the poster, which is a direct variant of the Japanese print. He even finds himself competing with a certain Toulouse-Lautrec for a project destined for the Moulin Rouge in Paris's Montmartre district. The two artists will nevertheless found a friendship based on this renewal of the art of lithography. In 1891, he decides to become a painter because he wants to have a life that allows a certain liberty. For a young man of this era, being an artist-painter represents a certain liberty. So he begins to make illustrations, and especially posters. And in particular, a poster for Franche Champagne that we have in our collection, which was noticed by the great artist Toulouse-Lautrec. Bonnard will propose to accompany him to the printer, who made the poster for him. And this is how Pierre Bonnard, young as he is, will encourage Toulouse-Lautrec to make posters himself. And they will compete with each other for the poster of the Moulin Rouge in Paris. A contest that, of course, Toulouse-Lautrec will win, with the success that he has afterwards. Toulouse-Lautrec is a painter, who we know quite well, but who dies quite young compared to Pierre Bonnard. He frequented the circle of the Revue Blanche, with Bonnard, Avrillard and the rest of the Nabi painters. The circle of the Revue Blanche had been created by Tadej Natasson, who attracted many artists, including writers and theatre people, as well as young painters like Pierre Bonnard and more established painters like Toulouse-Lautrec. It's through this circle of the Revue Blanche that Bonnard will frequent Toulouse-Lautrec, who will be fascinated by the liberty he takes in making this first poster for France Champagne in 1891. Here, we are in the middle of the nebulous Nabi period, but also the fascinating period of the Revue Blanche that lasts until 1903. The Revue Blanche is a literary and artistic magazine with anarchist leanings, with which the greatest writers and artists of the area collaborated. Its adventure only lasted 10 years, but it played an essential role in the reassessment of the establishment. Created, financed and directed by the three Natanson brothers, with the enthusiastic complicity of their fellow students from the Condorcet High School in Paris, the Revue Blanche is a portal through which artists and the public can meet in a more democratic manner. The Parisians is a lithograph published by the Revue Blanche, as is the schoolgirl, another lithograph. The Nabi generation sought to develop art along with life and to multiply their works through the means and techniques that were available at the time. With the renewal of printmaking, for example, or colour lithography, like we see here on this screen, or here with the schoolgirl. So they developed these techniques as a way to circulate their works as widely as possible to a social class that could not buy paintings. They wanted to reach the largest public possible, and often 50 or 100 copies of these lithographs were published, which seemed like a lot to us today because these are rare items. But at the time, these kinds of distributions was huge. It represented lower costs than 
selling a painting and made it possible to reach a larger part of society. Starting in 1896, Pierre Bonnard decides to change his path to work towards a new sense of composition, while still cultivating the intimacy that will be his trademark. Doing so, female figures are predominant in the works of the painter. He will have many models, but Marthe, who Bonnard meets a few years earlier, will be his inspiration, his muse for the length of his career. Bonnard rencontre Marthe, Bonnard meets Marthe in 1893. Marthe, whose real name is Maria Boursin, makes artificial flowers. She will become Bonnard's companion, as well as his practically exclusive model. Here, Marthe is shown in her bed with a rather lascivious attitude that was quite audacious at the time. The artist is plunged over the bed and several figures appear around the nude. Close to Marthe, there is a small dog curled up in a ball near her hair. What is equally interesting in this painting is that Bonnard will summon a lot of phantasmagoric elements in the folds of the sheets and the large shadow that move around the bed. In the foreground, you can see a shape that's quite caricatured, like a person, a kind of voyeur, standing at the foot of the bed, very large and disproportionate. You can also see shapes that are almost animal, outlined in the folds of the sheets around the female body. This painting belonged to Tade Natasson, who was the director of the Revue Blanche, then passed to his brother, Alexandre Natasson, before it was bought by Félix Fénéon, an art critic. This is a significant pedigree for Bonnard in the 90s. And in this you can see the loyalty of the Revue Blanche group made up of nabby artists, as well as the group of editors-in-chief and art critics who will work for the Revue Blanche. This painting received its name, The Indolent, quite soon, making an allusion to Bonnard's love life and announcing an entire series of large nudes, for which Marthe will be virtually the only model. All these depictions of Marthe, before a mirror, sitting, leaning over, in the bathroom, drowsy, reflect immediacy, discretion, admiration. The works are exceptional in the audacity of their framing, the richness of tones, and the play of light. With the painting, nude reflected in a mirror, we are at the end of the Nabi group in the early 1900s, but is not dated precisely. You can see that Bonnard is really more and more interested in the depiction of the new in the interior. There is a nude woman shown here who is probably Marthe. You can recognize the curves of her body and her face, which already appeared in illustrations of the era, and is here compared to the disproportion of this body that is probably somewhat androgynous. It is Bonnard without being Bonnard, as we can't recognize his face at all. It is nevertheless the physique that he had at the time, a very slender man, very tall, thin and stretched out, that we recognise in photographs of him that were taken nude in the countryside. We recognise this person as both male and female. There is also a large painting by Bonnard in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris that is called The Man and the Woman, where you see this confrontation between two bodies. We are also in an interior with a subject that will interest Bonnard greatly later on, which is a depiction of a reflected image. Like this, this is the reflection of these two bodies in a mirror. We can clearly see the edge of the mirror, which is here, and the objects that are on this piece of furniture depicted and reflected in the mirror. So it's really the confrontation of an image and its reflection, as well as the way it transformed by being reflected in the mirror.
The whole of Bernal's work is marked by his doubts, his worries, his battle with himself and with painting. The self-portraits and portraits that he creates underline the depth of these reflections, this indecision. Bonal thus affirms his presence and his liberty from exterior trends. In any case, he liked to say, I'm not from any school, I just try to make something personal. The Nabi movement ends at the beginning of the 20th century, but it does not really have an end date, because each artist will, at their own speed, gradually move away from the rules of the movement. Bona will always be attracted to having his own freedom, but he will nevertheless keep in close contact with his Nabi friends until the end of his life, both Maurice Denny or Edouard Vuillard. He will remain friends with them until the end of their lives, in 43 for Maurice Denis and in 42 for Edward Vuillard, who will be his best friend. He will gradually take a kind of liberty with the movement, because if Bonnard is so invested in painting, it is precisely in order to have a certain freedom. It only half pleases him to be part of a group if he's also locked in its constraints. So he will gradually take his independence. In the early 20th century, the Nabi group no longer exists, and he will be more and more interested in nature, because that is what really really appeals to him the most. He wants to see what painting can bring to the depiction of this natural environment. He already has his family home in the Dauphiné region, which is called The Close, in which he did a lot of work in his youth. Next, he had his Parisian studio, which he will move frequently, but he also likes to escape Paris, to avoid having too many outside influences. He likes to work in Normandy, and in 1912, he acquires a house that's close to Monet's home in Giverny village. He moves to Vernonnet in Normandy, in a house he will call his trailer, which is situated on a high point. He loves these vast views and a horizon that's quite wide. He likes to be isolated, but not too much, so he chooses the place he lives and works very meticulously. Before buying his trailer, Bonnard had undertaken a series of trips with his friend Villard to the beach towns of Trouville and Arcachon in France, as well as abroad. On each of his trips, he rented a house with a garden, enjoying the environment, the lush vegetation, and the view. Then in 1912, he settles in Vernonnet, in the Seine Valley, where he puts more and more care into his colors. The position of these two paintings really says a lot, because it's the same chromatic range again with this dominant green and orange. This is the illusion of depth that is given by the blues, which are a little more sustained. And then you discover each flower in this kind of jumble that is, in fact, very organized in the end. Then all of a sudden, you discover a detail. Two little chickens here that are busy pecking. This is often the case with him. You see a character who you hadn't noticed who might be busy doing something. Then there's this rather miraculous play of the touch that seems to spill over everywhere. This bursting colour, very sunny. And you have this play of the blues that will cool it down a little, but in the end, not that much, this area. There are areas that are virtually abstract, where you have the impression it's really the hand and the play of colours on the surface that give this painting its completely vitalist and solar side. It's with the discovery of the French Riviera in 1904, during a trip to see his friends in Saint-Tropez, that his painting becomes dazzling, wrapped in a great luminous intensity. It struck me like the Thousand and One Nights, he will say. The sea, the yellow walls, and the reflections as colorful as the light will now stay with him down to the smallest details in his paintings. From then on, he will constantly be coming to spend a few months on the coast, where he'll meet his friends Henri Mangan and Paul Signac. 
Pierre Bonnard, uh, Pierre Bonnard will discover the light of the south of France through Henri Monga, who is one of the fauve artists, along with Matisse, Derain and Camois. Monga has a home in Saint-Tropez, and since they see each other often in Paris, he will invite him to come to see the French Riviera. In Saint-Tropez, Bonnard will discover the light of the south of France, this light that is very different from the light of the north, as well as that of Normandy, which he has known well for several years. He will be tempted to come in both the summer and the winter, so it's really through Manga as Signac that he will discover the French Riviera. Here you have a small painting by Bonnard that depicts the port of Saint-Tropez. Bonnard came to Saint-Tropez for the first time on Manguin's invitation in 1909. He will then make numerous trips to Saint-Tropez, staying with Manguin each time. He will even rent a house for a summer or two, but he's only a visitor in Saint-Tropez, not someone who will move there. So this little painting that depicts the port of Saint-Tropez is quite quickly sketched. It doesn't compare to the paintings he will make when he moves permanently to La Carnet. It's almost a study. But this is a period for Bonnard, after his Nabi period, when he sees the rise of Fauvism, starting in 1905, and he will begin to question his fine art practice. He seeks to seize the light at any price, and it's true that the sky on this painting in particular is really extraordinarily well painted. It's rather beautiful nuances translate an ambience that's just after or before a storm, with its violets and mauves. Apart from Saint-Tropez, where he discovered the light of the Mediterranean, Bonnard travelled through the French Riviera and stayed in the city of Grasse, as well as the city of Antibes, where he rented hotel rooms. He liked to stay several days, weeks or even months in certain hotels, and he will end up moving permanently to the village of Le Canet, not far from the city of Cannes. In Grasse and in Antibes, he will paint views of the sea and views of the port in Cannes. He will never really move too far outside this rather narrow territory of Grasse, Antibes and Le Canet. What interests Bonnard in this part of the French Riviera is really the location of Le Canet, a city that overlooks the Bay of Cannes and the hills of Estrel. This geographic point is the trait that will really interest him, as well as the light of day and also night, as with this sunset here. This painting is really very important to our collection and interesting in more than one way, as we obtained it courtesy of the Mayer Foundation. Thanks to this painting, our museum received the designation Museum of France because it led the direction of the museums of France to understand the importance of our project. But it's also interesting from a more artistic point of view because this is a painting from the 20s when Bonnard had just moved to Le Canet. He takes possession of this vast landscape in which you can see the hills of Estrel. You can sense that it's probably from this environment, in his garden, that he will orient himself and focus on a certain framing of the landscape. He won't always use standard formats, almost never in fact, because Bonnard doesn't paint using ready-made frames. So he can give his landscape the format that it calls for. Bonnard rarely paints freehand. Most often he makes drawings in notebooks beforehand. And afterwards, on the canvas, he will reuse the details that are most important for the composition he wants to create. So he works in notebooks, on drawings that are quite small, then enlarges them to work with watercolours. He will also outline the main arrangements and major traits of his composition. 
He will then work with fairly diluted colours, but always in the same range with a richness of green, for example. You can see that he doesn't hesitate, even in the 20s. There are drips. It's not necessarily perfectly made. He is an artist who works rather slowly. It takes a lot of time for his paintings to ripen. He works slowly, but he is able to work on several paintings at once. On the wall of his studios, you often see four or five works in progress. He can work on them at the same time because he is able to concentrate on different subjects at once. After having outlined his composition on the canvas, Bonal proceeds with small rapid touches. Then he steps back, judges, then continues in this manner, as Edouard Vuillard shows so well in the painting he made of his friend. A very nice thing about this portrait of Bonnard is that there is also his palette with his true colours. And there is also this painting within the painting. It's a decoration that really exists and is part of private collection in Chicago. Here, his friend Vuillard made a successful portrait through the paint, the accessories, the dog and this sculpture he had made. There are all these odds and ends in this studio home, because for Bonnard, they were always there. He lived in his studio. Bonnard had always made watercolours, because he had a long-standing interest in drawing, but drawing augmented by colour, so he used watercolours. He will appreciate aquarelle, a form of watercolour, a little, and use them from time to time, but mixed with gouache, another form of watercolour. Gouache approaches the technique of oil painting, in that it allows him to revisit the painting, because Bonnard is laborious, in the good sense of the term, always wanting to return to a work. Sometimes he takes several years to decide that a work is finished. He is an artist who doesn't finish his work in a flash. He is not able to make something in two days. Bonnard moves to the south of France in 1922. He's won over for good by this peaceful haven that meets the health requirements of his wife Marthe on one hand and fulfills his search for tranquility, nature and height on the other. He will make over 300 paintings there. This is the port of Cannes, depicted by Bonnard. And you can clearly see the difference with the previous painting that had the feeling of a sketch. Here it's almost 10 years later. He has already moved to Le Canet and he's conveying something else. This is the Bonnard we cherish. Because it's shaped by solids. It's a twilight, a sunset, but everything melts and turns solid, it all hardens, and it all becomes magical in a way. He will come quite regularly in the winter, starting in 1922. First, he will rent houses like The Dream or The Swallow until he finds his house, The Bosque, The Grove, in 1926. He will buy it and begin renovations in order to build a studio facing north and create a bathroom, which was not common at the time. These are the famous bathrooms in which he'll be able to watch his wife take baths, which will give him some essential subjects for his paintings. He will also create a balcony and a magnificent garden that will enchant him bit by bit. Le Bosquet will really become his paradise. He will live here, in the heights of Le Canet village, like a traveller, inside his own home. Home, and will paint all the rooms, one after another, in a meticulous manner, but also conveying a real sensitivity and intimacy in all of them. He will also paint his gardens, where he will enjoy working the land and will enrich it on an aesthetic level, which will thrill him. He will thus continue to travel through the hills, which were much less inhibited at the time. Here in his house, the Bosquet, Pierre Bonnard will be able to externalize on the canvas all the difficulty of expressing his interior emotions. 
Nothing here can disrupt the link between the imagination and the paint, which becomes the artist's reality. Bonnard is known for his landscapes because they make up the largest part of his work. Nevertheless, the interiors are very important and they are what fascinated the public the most. In particular, the theme of the intimate interiors, especially those centered around his relationship with Marthe, who became his companion very early and later his wife. It's practically a work of introspection into his life and what went on behind closed doors between him and his wife in Le Canet. The work that there is between a dialogue and a non-dialogue. You can sense the life that he might have had face to face with Marthe, which more or less isolated them. But he made it a quality of his painting. Through the introspection he made of his home and its universe, like that of the bathroom. Aside from these nudes in the bathroom, there are also intimate interiors where the the human present is often absent, but when the human presence is there, around breakfast for example, they are thus moments that are somewhat stated, furtively, with Marthe whom he observed, and the character of his companion, who was really misanthropic and had a lot of problems with society and her relationship with others, is really visible in the atmosphere of Bonnard's paintings. There is this re-centering around a person, as well as the effects of framing that are important to his paintings. Six years separate this absolutely ravishing, stunning bust from this large painting depicting a woman looking at herself in the mirror, whose reflection we, the spectators, also look at. There is still this painting within a painting, in the representation of space, redoubled here as well by the presence of these coloured screens that are in the doorway. You can see the wallpaper of the room in the background and also the different walls of the bathroom reflected in the mirror. This construction is very complex and also a way of interrogating the representation of space in modern painting. We can think of Matisse at this time, who also pursues a reflection into the mental space of the painting, which is also a space of colour, materials and light, as you can see on this large back reflecting the light that arrives from the side. For Bonnard, this interrogation and his painting takes on very pearly, vibrant colours that give a lot of warmth to his depictions. Bonnard observed his wife without ever having her pose, because he really liked to work stealthily. Not like a voyeur, but like an observer, more like the positive side of observation. You can see how he encloses the body of this woman in a rather narrow, vertical format, and if she has to raise her head, she'll reach the top of the painting. In this painting, the theme is a nude that is very vertical. Marthe always had this posture, a little curved in on herself, never very straight. We have the motif of the mirror here, 
She is in the middle of grooming herself, getting dressed and looking at her reflection. And another source of light comes from the French window, which is here. You can also recognize through a small detail that we are not in La Canet, but probably in the bathroom of the trailer in Normandy. There are details like that that persist from painting to painting in Bonnard's work. There are always elements to which he is faithful, whether it's the color of a wall or a radiator that is always there because he gives a lot of importance to objects that perhaps aren't that important, like the tile layout of a floor or a radiator that is disproportionately large. Towards the end of his life, Bonnard seems to find his way to a return towards a kind of impressionism, introducing mystery into the visible appearance, which could reveal an attraction to abstraction. A painting is a series of marks that join together and end up forming an object, the artist declared in 1942. The landscape is a major subject of his painting. For example, the bathers at the end of the day, which is a painting from the end of his life, around 1945. Bonnard is a man who is already nearly 80 years old and is quite famous, and people come from everywhere to see him in his Le Canet studio from Switzerland, from the United States, etc. At this time, he lost his wife in 1945, so he is quite alone in La Canée. So he makes regular, constant visits to the Meg family, and Amé Meg in particular, who he will really get close to and almost consider his son. They will regularly go together to picnic on the island of Lérence, off the coast of Cannes. One of these picnics will be immortalized by Adrien Meg in a photo he took when he was 14 years old, which is quite well known, where we see Bonnard in a swimsuit. You think of these moments that are really very pleasant for him, very enriching on human level, but also of his rendition of a landscape. Because you think of these events when you look at the painting, bathers at the end of the day. There is a sunset, but also people living together, and these shapes and colors that are like an impasto and are tied together. There is a kind of link at a human level between Bonnard and the men and the women of this family. This relationship between life and painting is important for him, and bit by bit he becomes interested in the construction of colour, the shapes of colour, and he moves closer and closer to abstraction. As early as the 30s, André Lotte, a great theorician of painting, says that Bonnard, without realising it, is becoming one of the most abstract artists of his age. With this painting from 1945, it's even more true because he is really fascinated by both the importance of light on colour and also ways this light can create shapes or dissolve shapes into each other. This is a very important painting because it is the second major purchase by the city of La Canet in 2008. The painting belonged to the editor, Derriades, who is the founder of the Revue Verve, with which Bonnard worked regularly. Great artists like Matisse worked for this review by making special editions. It is a time when reviews dedicated entire issues to artists. High quality reproductions of their works were printed and there could be texts as well. It is in his charming dovecote in Le Canet, as his friend Matisse put it, that Bonnard passes away on January the 23rd, 1947. His works, dominated by color, allowed him to glorify the light. The landscape played an essential role in his work. It's through his landscapes that Bonnard distinguished himself. For him, a dialogue with nature was a dialogue with painting. I invent nothing, I look. Bonnard cultivated this gift for observation every day, on his walks during which he gathered a provision of life. And Pierre Bonnard worked with every subject, landscapes, still lives, interior scenes, portraits, and nudes. This eye for the elements and the people who were dear to him was transposed by Bonnard in an original way into an intimate expression of the senses and the wonder at the beauty that surrounded him.